So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the transfer application process. And most of these questions have been asked on, and been fielded uh, via our, I'm just going to go off of audio here, um, off of video. A lot of us have um, talked about this over email a lot of times. So in order to transfer, in order to be an eligible transfer applicant to U of HLC, you need to have attended another accredited law school and you need to have completed the equivalent of your first year of law school. So generally speaking, those are your foundation courses of torts and property, criminal law, civil procedure. We want you to try to, to have completed most of those courses. If you, some classes don't teach uh, constitutional law until the second year, we will work with you. And there are some ways that we can work around that. The important thing to note is we need you to have a minimum of 22 credit hours and a maximum of 30 credits will transfer. So again, in order to meet the eligibility, 22 credit hours minimum, and you really can't transfer more than 30 credits. So here's the tricky part. Transfer credits will not, transfer credits will not be awarded to a class that has a grade of lower than a C. And I've had a lot of questions about this this week. Where this goes into is you first have to be admitted as a transfer student. Then we will look at your specific course grades and determine whether those credits will transfer. No grades ever transfer. And I was a transfer student myself and that really uh, to another law school. And that was really tough for me because I didn't get to transfer the A's or A, A B's or, or B's that I received. Only the credits transfer or the hours will transfer, not grades. So here's another big question that I get all the time. The alternative grading systems, how is that gonna impact my application? And here's what I will tell you, and hopefully everyone can hear me. And if you can't, please chat me. We are going to take into consideration that most, if not all schools, have gone to an alternative grading system of pass-fail um, for the second semester, given the pandemic. This will not impact your chances or your application. Everyone is in the same boat. We will still do a full file review of your application based upon the grades that we receive, along with all aspects of your application, such as your letters of recommendation, your class rank, um, and your personal statement, everything that is submitted to us. So again, if you, are, if you were subject to an alternative grading system, and we don't know any schools, I'm not aware of a law school out there that didn't go to an alternative grading system, pass, fail, grade, no grade. Um, we're just gonna do, we're gonna, we're gonna review your application with what we have, which in most cases is your first semester grades. So I hope that makes sense. We're gonna have a lot of discussion on this on the Q&A portion. So just stay with me and we'll go forward with it. So here's what your application must include. There's really two parts to this. And you really have to pay close attention to this. We're all lawyers and we're all future lawyers if you're seeking to trans transfer. So again, I always tell people one of the key components of being a lawyer is to analyze, research, and write. You need to analyze and really research the application process itself. And there's really two prongs to it. You have to complete online some portions via LSAC. That is where your application is. That's where you're submitting your personal statement on your reason for transferring. And that is where you're submitting your two letters of recommendation into your CAST report. The other aspect of your application is what's mailed to us at, at U of H. That's your official law school transcript that's going to contain all of your first year grades. And again, whatever grades you were issued, whether they were pass fail for the second semester or if you've got actual grades, but we're going to look at all of your grades that you submitted. But this has to be sent to us at U of H at the address listed below. You also need a letter of good standing and your class rank. Again, I get questions almost every day of how will it be handled the class rank if I had a semester of alternative grading such as a pass fail. And I tell people that is entirely up to how your school handles it. I believe that what they will do is determine the class rank based on the grades that you have, which would be your first semester. We cannot take transcripts any other way than by official means from your school. So you can't send us unofficial, you can't, you, you, you are welcome to go to your actual school and ask them to get the, get the transcripts and seal it in an envelope, but it has to come from your registrar. Now I'll give you a caveat to this. There are instances where because of COVID um, that you can ask the registrar, if it's the official registrar to email those official transcripts to us. 
as a means to getting to us quicker, but it must come from your official registrar of your law school. Um, more questions on that or, or I can address that later. So I hope everyone understands there are really two components to your application. One component that goes to LSAC, the other component that gets directly mailed to us. And we are not in the office right now, so it's not really beneficial. You can't actually get into us, but someone is there, they're opening the mail for us. So here are the deadlines. I want to be cognizant of my deadline. I only have five more minutes here. Our fall semester deadline early decision is June 29th. Our fall semester regular decision is July 15th. So what you want to do is you want to get everything into us by, you want to get your application in by July 29th. All of your file documents, everything else must be submitted no later than close of business on August 7th. So the early decision deadline is based on on-campus interviewing schedules that's set by our career development office. So if you have your application and your files complete by the early decision deadline, you'll receive your decision in time to apply for early first round of OCI. And Paul from our CDO office is gonna get into that with you. So here's a little bit of information on our admission stats. This is a breakdown of the last four years for us. We had, as you can see, 138, 107, 107 73 over the years. We admitted um, 39 and enrolled 27 in 2007. 2008, we had 107, admitted 36, enrolled 26. You can see there um, all the stats that we have there. 2019, um, we had 73 applications, admitted 16, and rolled 11. It does look like a slight dip in 2019. Um, I don't know the reason for that. I do know, and I talk to people about this quite often, it is a competitive process. We're looking for students that are relatively high in their class rank and that have done very well in their first year of school. Um, where do our transfers come from? Half come from other Texas schools. And the other half are from all over the country, including Texans who want to return home. We get a lot of that. So something we're going to talk about more during our Q&A session. If you are a transfer applicant, you do have the opportunity to write on a journal. Um, and as you can, as you're going to see in the later half of our presentation, three of our four speakers are on journals. They're on the Houston Law Review and the Houston um, Business and Tax Journal. So I can walk you through all of this for admitted transfer students, and you should have your decision in or relatively in soon. Um, the competition begins the second round. There's an ongoing competition right now that ends on June 12th, but you'd have to be admitted by that point. Um, admitted transfer students can participate in the second round, which begins on July 5th, and the deadline is August 2nd. And that's all done through the Office of Student Services. So again, your criteria for membership are your first year grades and a demonstrated proficiency in legal writing, which is um, shown on your writing competition. So the requirements to participate in the writing competition vary by journal. Houston Law Review, they typically want to see completion of your first year program, two full years remaining in law school, and somewhere in the range of the top 30% of your class. So some more details there that we have, um, and I have a lot of resources in our second panel that we can talk about it. Again, I'm just gonna quickly show you this. These are the different journals. I can share this with you at another time because I don't want, I want to be able to stay on course here. On campus interviewing OCI, we're gonna have Paul talk about that as well. Um, you will, if you complete your application within the early decision timeframe of July 29th, you will have the opportunity to participate in on-campus interviews. Sorry guys, I'm going so fast here. We are going to have our financial aid person, Laura Neal, join us, and she's gonna be joining us at the 1240 timeframe. Um, so she is gonna talk about financial aid on her end. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna hand over now, new share. Let's go to, Karen Jones, start video. Hopefully you guys, hey there. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, I'm gonna stop this and I'm gonna let Karen go right over and I'm gonna close out of this and hopefully. Okay, no new share, stop share. Okay, great. Thank you, Karen. Okay. So I'm gonna pass.
pass this over to Karen. She's going to talk to us about our JD LLM opportunities for transfer students. Great. Thank you. And uh, hello and welcome everyone. Um, again, my name is Karen Jones. I'm the Executive Director of Global and Graduate Programs at the University of Houston Law Center. Um, I also have oversight of the uh, Graduate Legal Studies Office. And one of the programs that we have um, uh, at the University of Houston Law Center is a joint JD LLM program. The joint JD LLM program allows our students, and that includes our transfer students, so it allows our students to obtain both a JD degree and an LLM degree at the same time. And um, it requires much less time to actually achieve that second degree. So, um, so basically, the way it works is that as you uh, study for your um, Juris Doctorate uh, or, or study to complete your Juris Doctorate degree, you can also begin taking some of the courses that would go towards the LLM degree. And you, by completing, on average, one additional semester, you can actually obtain both degrees, both the JD and the LLM degree. Um, it, now, typically, if you do it separately, um, finish your JD and then decide later to come back or, or go somewhere else and do your LLM, you're going to spend at least one additional full-time year to accomplish that LLM degree, and you're going to require um, more money to complete it because you're going to have to, to complete um, at, at University of Houston, uh, 24 credit hours if you do it separately. If you do your JD LLM at the same time, again, you can complete it uh, by, um, by doing one additional semester on average, and um, it's less cost because you're required to complete an additional 15 to 18 credit hours um, versus the 24 credit hours that you would have to complete um, if you do the, the program separately. So again, um, you save time and money. So just to give you a little bit of information on the different programs that, that are available, because the, the um, LLM degree allows you to um, identify a specialty area. Your Juris Doctorate uh, JD studies is more of a generalized law degree, but the LLM degree allows you to specialize. And so um, we have five specialty areas. We have tax law, health law, international law, energy, environment, and natural resources law, and um, intellectual property and information law. So those are the five uh, specialty areas. Now, with regards to, um, to applying, the reason I'm telling you about this now is because um, as you make the decision to uh, transfer, um, you have a, a certain window for, um, for uh, actually applying to the uh, joint JDLLM program. Typically, we require um, uh, JD students to have completed 30 credit hours before applying to the JDLLM program. But as a transfer student, um, you would need to also have completed a minimum of 12 credit hours at the University of Houston. Okay, so once you transfer in, um, so you have uh, 30 hours that you have to co have completed in your Juris Doctorate program just in general, but at least 12 of those hours have to have been completed at the University of Houston before you can apply for the JD LLM program. To apply for the JD LLM program, you can, um, you can reach out to LLM dot uh dot edu i'm sorry llm at uh dot edu so you can send an email if you're um if you're interested you can also find uh, more information 
on the on the uh, joint JDLLM uh, website, and you can access that website by going to the main law school page, and that is law.uh.edu. Um, the uh, admissions in the menu, and then select joint JDLLM. So that's for um, for more detailed information about the program. I'm checking my time. Okay, so I do have, still have a few minutes, so I will keep talking. Um, we, uh, we also have some, um, uh, uh, a, a testimonial uh, from some of the students that we've had in, in uh, previous years. And really, uh, I just want to uh, share a little bit of information with regards to some of the benefits of doing a JDLLM. Uh, as I mentioned, it gives you an opportunity to actually specialize in an area and, um, and show that specialty and, and actually um, do coursework that's going to give you um, a leg up in a particular industry or a particular area of law. Um, also, it, it um, really helps you to, um, to get into um, understanding uh, that particular area of law and begin to network because the courses that you take at the University of Houston um, within a particular specialty area is going to start introducing you to a lot of the people that, um, that you will work with in the industry. Uh, several of our programs are ranked um, in top 10. And, um, and so you, um, you really are uh, having the opportunity to, um, to get uh, some really uh, specialized uh, uh, training in those specialty areas by doing the LLM program. And doing it along with the JD really benefits you in time and money. Um, and the other reason for you to make the decision early in, um, in, uh, to do the JD LLM program is because you can, we will help you to identify the courses that you should take um, even before you finish your, um, your JD credits that will contribute towards your LLM program. So you can actually start taking some of the courses earlier um, so that you can make sure that you only have to complete that one additional semester to gain both degrees. So, um, so that is uh, some information about the JD LLM program. Again, if you want more information or you want to apply, please um, uh, go to um, the law school website, law.uh.edu, admissions, and select joint JD LLM, or you can send an email to llm at uh.edu. Thank you so much, Karen. We're really appreciative of your time. And um, it's a great, great program, folks. And I talked to a lot of our incoming students about uh, the benefits of the JD LLM program. So, and being able to specialize, but also not, uh, not um, avoiding the bar classes too. That's kind of how I've always looked at it. So you can accomplish both. So we're yes. going to move on to our career development talk. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, and introduce Paul to our group. We're all very lucky to have Paul. So Paul, I'll let you take it away. Hi, I'm Paul Klinger. I'm the Assistant Director with the Career Development Office here at the University of Houston Law Center. And uh, I'm sharing my uh, email address through the chat function so that if you have any follow-up questions after I've uh, delivered my talk here today, feel free to send me an email. Um, I'm glad to answer any questions you have, and I, I imagine you'll probably have some questions about our upcoming programming, especially the on-campus interviewing um, and those dates. Also, I want to post as well to the chat function, which is the next link that I'm sending. You'll see the full calendar for the different phases of OCI there. Um, it's under the employer tab on our, our web page, and uh, I, I just want to call out that student bidding for OCI is going to begin on June 25th and last through June 30th. So you see that that early decision timeline falls into that week. Um, so I, you know, my advice is the earlier you apply, the better to give yourself more time uh, to get documents ready to submit 
um, for OCI applications that you would upload through our Simplicity portal. I'm sure your schools that you're coming from have similar systems, so you're probably familiar with that process. Um, but I would just call your attention to two things. One, you're going to need to update your resume to reflect the transfer, and I'm happy to send you a um, uh, transfer resume sample once you've become officially enrolled and, and that process is complete so that we can get that ball rolling. Um, two, you're going to want to make sure that you, you have your transcript from your previous school in hand ready to go because that's something that's typically asked um, at, for as part of the application packages that you submit um, throughout OCI. And you also want to allow yourself time to draft cover letters, especially if you're intending on doing a high number of bids. Customizing cover letters can take uh, some real time. Um, and that process is something that our office wants to engage in with you and help you strategize about how to approach legal employers um, uh, individually so that your cover letters are effective in introducing you to each one of them. So. I'll back out now from my um, talk about OCI and just talk a little bit about what our office does and ha how it looks right now. Um, obviously, we're, we're functioning remotely. We're conducting our, our full suite of services uh, just in a remote capacity, a lot of phone calls, a lot of Zoom sessions, and obviously, we want to work with you across the platform and format that you're most comfortable with. So, you, you know, if you want to do an introductory session with me once you're enrolled so that we get you set up on Simplicity, it doesn't matter to me if it's over a Zoom session or a phone call. I, from a counseling perspective, I, I would prefer Zoom so that I can put a face to the name and, and start building my understanding of who you are and what you're going for. But uh, you, you make that call ultimately. We're still doing um, things like conducting mock interviews to help people prepare for employers. We have a formal mock interview program that we conduct twice a year where we bring outside attorneys in to sit with a member of the CDO and conduct a, a kind of panel style interview to help people adjust to that process. And we're certainly ready to help you prepare for virtual interviews and meetings of all sorts, uh, as well as kind of give you written advice on how to approach that process through our document library on Simplicity. Um, we, I also want to mention something that I think has been uh, incredibly effective in helping people transition into a new, new school environment, and that is a mentoring program that we have for upper-level students, 2Ls and 3Ls, full-time students, part-time students, where we pair you with a practicing attorney in a work setting of your preference um, for a year so that you can correspond with them. The program's going to look a little bit different this year, I imagine, um, based on what we're all seeing right now. There's not going to be as much or any face-to-face uh, -face meeting, but we're obviously going to help people develop protocols so that correspondence is routine and conducted uh, through the available platforms, be it Zoom, Skype, a phone call, whatever. Uh, and I've gotten feedback from our, our past uh, classes of uh, transfer students that they found it incredibly helpful uh, to be paired with that mentor, both as a way to kind of understand the remaining part of law school and the culture at University of Houston Law Center, and also to kind of introduce themselves to the legal market in Houston, um, because it is a large one uh, and it can be uh, intimidating to navigate because there's so many different kinds of opportunities uh, and, and things available to you out there. Having someone who's been inside of it, who's moved around uh, and, and knows the ins and outs can be a, a really uh, welcome introduction to a new city, a new market, and a new school. So I, I highly recommend that. We also offer programming continuously throughout the year where we're trying to put you in touch with attorneys, um, you know, in different settings such as lunch with a lawyer, dinner with a lawyer, where you'll see, um, you know, a small class of students uh, paired up with an attorney just in, enjoying conversation over a meal. Uh, and we think that's going to be incredibly helpful. Uh, especially for the upcoming year and helping people develop their careers, understand what they want to do, and, and keep moving forward in terms of their own self-education and uh, developing professional skills. So um, the, the other things that I, I think bear mentioning, in addition to on-campus interviewing sessions, uh, we offer things like a small and mid-sized career fair once a semester where we attract legal employers that might not typically come to a larger OCI session. Uh, small and mid-sized firms, some government agencies that just want to hire at that time of year where we offer that programming. And we also offer a very large uh, table talk recruiting style event 
called GPIT, which stands for Government and Public Interest Table Talk. If you're interested in government work, nonprofit work, anything related to public interest and public service, those employers uh, show up for that uh, and you will have the opportunity to interact with them, drop application documents on them, start a, start a conversation that ultimately we hope leads to an interview and a job opportunity. So we um, also offer employment statistics via our page. Um, you'll see uh, down under quick links, the bottom one, if you wanna take a look at what our uh, classes have done uh, post-graduation since 2017, click that link there. Um, the most recent data is for 2019. I don't believe we have the salary data up yet for that class, but we do offer the uh, ABA summary of where, what industries what sectors the jobs fell into for the class of 2019. And I think that's been posted fairly recently and it's a, it's a great way to sort of introduce yourself to uh, the, the numbers that your um, class typically follows in terms of you know, what sector they're going to, private practice, government practice, education, uh, you, you know, what size firms. It, it, it gets really detailed and really interesting once the salary data is posted as well. So I encourage you to look at that as a way to sort of gauge what's going on, the interaction between the employment market and the school here in Houston. It's very informative. Oh, did, like you want me to, did you want me to navigate on a particular yeah. spot in the page for you? Oh, um, you, can, you can click, uh, yeah, if you click the employment statistics quick link, the, the fourth one there. Yeah, I just like them to see the, the format. So if you just scroll down, you'll see from 2019 all the way back to 2017, we offer the employment summary from the American Bar Association, as well as the now salary information for uh, the, the classes dating back to 2017 now. Uh, and I, it's something I look at often and I think it's incredibly useful uh, for a variety of reasons. And if you have any questions about that, once you review it again, feel free to reach out to me through email. We can set up a call to discuss it. I think it's useful uh, and, and, and helps inform your decision-making going forward as a, as a prospective attorney. I'd also like, uh, if you can, Ann Margaret, to click on make an appointment just so that's in people's minds. I, you know, as soon as you make a decision, I want you to know how to contact us and set up an appointment immediately so that we can get going on OCI if that's something that you're interested. This kind of gives you, a, a, this provides you the suite of options available for appointments. And what we're going to do, we're, we're going to do an intro session, an advising session, so you can either click JD Career Counseling or Student Advising. Uh, because we don't have a dedicated transfer answer um, uh, option. I'm, I'm the dedicated transfer counselor, so whatever option you choose, just make sure that you choose me uh, because I want to um, quickly process that, that first meeting we have and get you set up on Simplicity so that you can start looking at recruiting events like OCI, start sending, in the, sending out those applications and fall in that window where you're making it into the bidding period and you're not being excluded because it's tight time frame there and I know how important it is and I, I, I want to be of service to you as quickly as I can and I know it's urgent and it's uh, one of the most time sensitive periods of the year for me as a counselor and I just want you to know that I'm, I'm dedicated to being there um, and immediately responding as soon as I get that email so you can expect that from me a quick response especially that week because I know how much is going on and how much is on the line so, um, I'd also like to back out and look at our staff page just to give people a sense of who's in our office. And that'll be the, the last thing that I cover. So if you go up to meet the staff there, that's great. Um, and I just want to introduce uh, the assistant dean of our office, Tiffany Tucker, uh, who comes from a transactional background in big law and also has a great counseling background. I urge each of you to, to reach out to her early in your, your time at U of H. Uh, she's an incredible resource for students and knows so much. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I study under her every day, so I think I know what I'm talking about. We're also lucky to have Courtney James as our Director of Employer Relations uh, and Development. Uh, Courtney uh, did a stint with uh, B&E here in Houston before joining UHLC, so she has a very uh, strong grasp of the Houston legal market, uh, has great intelligence to share whenever students have questions about particular firms, a great resource as well. If you're interested in judicial opportunities, externships, internships, Bill Powers is the person you want to set up an appointment with uh, to discuss those matters in detail. I'm certainly willing to entertain the lightweight questions, but Bill is our resident expert in that area and does a great job for students 
um, telling them how to secure those positions. I'd also like to point to uh, Chandria Jackson, who's our Associate Director for Career Development and has an engineering background and is of special uh, help to anyone with a, a similar background who's interested in the various areas of intellectual property uh, and, and also just has an amazing understanding of off-campus interview programs that are out there. And that's a very uh, shifting, evolving world. So if you have any uh, detailed questions about off-campus stuff, uh, like Sunbelt, for instance, think things like that, uh, the Loyola interview program, uh, Chandria is going to be very helpful in that regard. I encourage you to reach out. Uh, our newest counselor is Anton Montano. He's also an assistant director like myself. Uh, and he comes from an employment and labor uh, background, business litigation, uh, and, and also has his LLM uh, in, in uh, taxation. So um, he's someone I really enjoy working with. He's a, a great resource for our office. And uh, I, I hope that if there are any issues that I can't be of immediate service on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to him in, in his particular practice areas and expertise. He also had a federal uh, clerkship. Uh, and is a great resource for talking through how to succeed in that environment if that's something you're planning to do post-grad. Um, and and I'll, I'll quickly run through the rest of our office. I know I'm out of time. Annalise uh, Doyce uh, does our employment stats. So um, she is very well versed in those charts and those numbers that we looked at a little bit earlier on our page. ECA Branch and Sanchez still are our program manager and our program coordinator. And they're gonna be essential in uh, the OCI process. They're great people to be in touch with for day-to-day -day changes in that regard, the scheduling concerns, and basically knowing what employers are, are doing in any kind of variation from traditional process. They're great points of contact with all of our programming, but especially important during OCI because they, they, they run that day-to-day. -day. So I just want you to be aware of in our office, who's supporting you, and uh, the, the great talent that we have helping you in your career development. Um, with that, I'm going to conclude my remarks and say thank you for listening today. And please feel free to reach out to me with any questions regarding professional development, OCI, any of our programming. I, I'm glad to talk in, deep, uh, in detail about any of that. Thank you. Paul, well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Um, hopefully you all can still hear me. It might be a little bit of feedback. So I'm going to stop the share now and I'm going to introduce our amazing assistant or assistant dean of student services, Monica Mensa. Hi, Monica. Thank you for coming Hello. along. Coming Thank on. you. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Monica Mensa, not to get confused with Pilar Mensa. Yes, we're both assistant deans. Um, I'm in student affairs and Pilar Mensa is assistant dean for admissions. And so you guys have like, we've been working with her and her team um, on your acceptance to the law center. Um, so yes, we are technically related, married to brothers. So now that we're all acquainted. Um, so my office um, handles pretty much all things students with the exception of um, career. So that's why with the, our sessions are bifurcated. So um, pretty much anything students, exams, um, advising, um orientation graduation all that good stuff runs through my office and so hopefully i will see um all of you um in about a month or so when we do our transfer orientation um to welcome you and to give you a little bit more information about what it looks like to be a transfer student um a acclimated um to one of our um uhlc students um when you get here in the fall. So um, I apologize, my son is eating lunch, so you may hear a little bit of um, ruckus in the background. So I'll talk, um, have four points um, while we're talking. And as um, Anne Margaret stated, if you have questions for me, feel free to shoot them in the chat. Um, it's not too many of you, about 30, 30 or so. And so, yeah, feel free to shoot me a question if you have them. So I'll talk about graduation requirements just briefly. Um, talk about the credit earning opportunities that we have um, at the Law Center outside of just regular coursework. Um, I'll talk about our fall and spring course structure because I'm sure you all are wondering, um, are we going to be in person? Are we going to be live? And what what that what's that going to look like? Um, so I'll answer any questions you guys have about that. And then just a brief takeaway point at the end. And so graduation requirements, you guys will likely have anywhere from 20 to 30 hours that you're transferring over from your other law school. And so those hours were transferred in total to graduate from the law center, you need 90 credit hours. So you will have completed one third roundabout um, 
in regards to how many hours you need for graduation. And then we have a few other course requirements, um, but not many. Really, you just, you come and you can take whatever you want um, and you can go forth and be great. And so that's, that's one thing I love about um, our course curriculum is that we have very few actual course requirements outside of um, the 1L curriculum. And so um, you really have a lot of leeway to take classes that you're interested in with professors that you like, um, to not necessarily get a specialty, but you can certainly market yourself that way. So you can um, take employment law classes, you can take employment discrimination, employment law, um, anti-discrimination, all these types of courses that um, you're interested in, and then use that to market yourself, work with our career office to market yourself um, in that particular subject area. So. Um, that's pretty great. So graduation requirements, like I said, very, very simple. We'll discuss that at, um, a little bit more at transfer orientation once you guys are here. Um, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know. Um, but as far as credit earning opportunities, we have so many at the Law Center. So this is outside of what your typical law class looks like. So we have clinics, for example. So these are hands-on practical um, classes that you can take. You're working with clients you're going to court, you're doing all the things that you would do as a lawyer and you get credit for it. It goes toward the 90 degree, um, 90 hours that you need for the JD degree. So it's super great. We have wonderful, wonderful um, clinical faculty on staff um, and we have so many options. We have criminal law, transactional law, um, immigration and the list goes on and on and so you can certainly get credit for um, taking those clinics so that's one opportunity another opportunity your journals um, so you'll likely hear um, if you haven't already from our admissions teams about the wonderful journal opportunities we have for our transfer students um, I believe last year it was we had a transfer student who was the editor-in-chief of law review so you guys are certainly capable of doing above and beyond once you get here um, and we are willing to help you however we can to make sure that that transition is as seamless as possible so that you can you know come in be great and you know do the big things that you guys are certainly capable of achieving um blake our blakely advocacy institute is another great um, resource on campus where you can get credit for um participating in competitions moot court mock trial um, and other various competitions that they have advocates board and things like that and so um, once you get here i'll direct you to um, our director an associate director of the Blakely Advocacy Institute and you'll likely have them come and speak to you actually I have them on um, my list for orientation so they'll come and speak to you and let you know how you can join those teams and get credit for those competitions that you're interested in doing um, and then another opportunity one of um, I feel like it kind of an overlooked opportunity is our non law graduate coursework. And so as transfer students, you can take up to six hours of non law graduate coursework. So essentially, that's a graduate program on the UH campus. So that's a business graduate business course, a graduate psychology course, a graduate social work course, whatever it is, um, something that you may be interested in. And that was certainly um, help your overall career goals in the legal field. So I have many students who take, um, you know, business administration or, you know, statistics or something like that because they're interested in pursuing um, that type of law and it will, it, it'll help them. Um, so you can get, you can get credit for that and it'll come over. It'll essentially be um, pass fail technically. So you get graded um, in that course, but when you transfer it over, it's satisfactory credit. So um, it's a great way to, um, you know, branch outside of the law center while not necessarily affecting your GPA because I know that is that's that can be a big um, question. So um, we can certainly discuss those options once you guys, you know, come on board, but I just wanted to present those and let you know that there are so many opportunities that we have for you guys if you are interested in doing something other than, you know, the typical sit in a classroom, take a law school exam, because we all know that that can get a bit monotonous. So, um, so yeah, um, I don't see any questions, so I'll just go on to the fall, spring, hope, hopefully not spring, but possibly spring class structure, and so we recently got um, an email from our president saying that classes, one second, I see your question, I'll be right there. Um, we got an email from our president saying that um, classes should be in person, but we do realize the, um, the risk of doing so. And so we are trying to implement a hybrid model where um, most of our classes will be 
asynchronous, some will be synchronous. Asynchronous means that we're essentially, um, you have recorded material or recorded PowerPoints or lectures or whatever, and you can go back and review them whenever you want. Synchronous meaning that you are live with your professor at a scheduled meeting time. And so a hybrid of those, some will be on in person, um, some will be a combination of synchronous and asynchronous. So the Actual details are still being worked out, but know that we are doing all that we can. Um, we know how important being in a classroom is, but we do, um, we're prioritizing your safety and the safety and health of everyone around you um, first. So we will keep you all posted. Um, once you guys get here in the fall, you'll have all those details. But for now, just know that we, um, we care about you and we're doing everything to protect you. And let me go to the question. The question is, what is the difference between attending as a visiting student versus a transfer student? Can a student attend as a visiting student and retain the credits after transferring later? That's an interesting question. So if you are only wanting to visit for a semester, essentially you would you'd probably visit for 15 credit hours or so those hours would transfer back to your original school um, and then you would have to apply as a transfer student and I, I don't know that you'd be able to do the timeline for admissions I'm not sure that you would be able to do both be a visiting student for one semester and then come back as a transfer student so that's that's a tricky question you might want um, my recommendation is to email um, Probably Assistant Dean Pilar Mensa, that, because that would depend on the timeline for application. The credits would be a different question and we'd have to work that out. I'm not sure that we've seen that particular scenario before, but we can certainly work with you if it's something that um, would work with admissions. Okay, and um, if there are no other questions, I just wanted to leave you guys with the take the takeaway point. Um, like I said, our transfer students have been very, very successful um, at the law center, and I have no doubt that you all will too. Um, you just have to you have to work hard and know that once you get to the law center, that you are a UHLC student. You are not a student from wherever you came. It's not something that um, you have to broadcast or tell people. Like you, you come in and you belong. So that's. Um, you possibly applied before and were waitlisted or didn't get it. Whatever the case is, you are here now and you belong. So I, like I said, at orientation, I will work with you guys. I'll have other transfer students who um, can come and speak with you guys so that you know that UHLC is your home and that you can be just as successful as anyone else. So um, with that, I want to say, you know, go forth and be great. And if you have any questions or concerns, um, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call. I'm happy to help in whatever way I can. Thanks so much. Thank you, Monica. Really fortunate to have had Monica, um, Assistant Dean Mensa, on with us today. So we really appreciate that. I hope my audio is working correctly. So we are going to now turn to Laura Neal, who is our financial aid advisor. Um, hopefully Laura will be able to pop up here. Does my, uh, just chatting up here, is my audio okay for everyone? Can everyone hear me okay? Just making sure on this. And then Laura, if you're ready, we'll have you um, just come right on. Sounds great. Thank you, Karen. And let's see, does anyone have questions while we're waiting for Laura to come on? Does anyone have the questions that are popping up um, that you want to shoot over to us and ask? I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, I know Laura's on here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You don't see me though, right? I do not see you, no. Okay, uh, this is my first Zoom meeting, uh, so I'm not hey. sure what all I need to do. Hi there, uh, and Margaret. Um, I'm going to click one more thing. I hope I don't get cut off. Uh, do you have a, can you tell me how I need to show up? Can you hear me still? Yes, I can hear you. Do you know how I can make my photo come up or my me? Okay, so on um, in the box right here to the, there should be three little dots and you can go, I can even start your video for you, I think. Okay. Did it come up? Did I just click start my video? Yep. There we go. I am. Hi. Yay. <laughs> All right. This is my first time to be on Zoom, so I wasn't sure how to do it. Um, I had to have a, a, 
a trial run the other day, um, but thank you. I am Laura Neal. I'm currently the financial aid person for the Law Center. Um, I work just with law students. Uh, you are, uh, most anyone that's awarded uh, financial aid will go through Central Campus, but I am here just for law students. And once you are come to the Law Center, you are one of our students and I'll be more than happy to assist you with whatever I can. Uh, and once you are accepted, you will receive a student ID number. Uh, this is where you will do everything in PeopleSoft when you log in. It will be um, to register, to check your grades, to make payments. Uh, so once you are uh, accepted and you receive this student ID, I highly recommend that you uh, get logged into PeopleSoft, look around and see how to maneuver in, inside of PeopleSoft because this is where you will do everything. Um, I would also encourage you to, if you're filing for financial aid, um, to check your to-do list to make sure that there's nothing that's showing up that you need to complete in order to go through the financial aid process. Um, to be admitted um, or being admitted into the law program, you have to maintain a certain GPA, um, continue to show academic progress. You have to be enrolled in a minimum of six hours to receive financial aid. It can't have any student loans in default and be a U.S. citizen. If you've already received financial aid your first year, it's going to be the same across the board, uh, across the U.S. It's not different for each school. Uh, and the first step would be to add UH, not the law center specifically, just the University of Houston to your FAFSA. You need to file a 2021 FAFSA. You're going to be using your 2018 tax information and you need to list our school, which is 003652. That's the only way we're going to get your FAFSA is if you list our school code on there. And this is something that you're going to need to do every October for the next academic year. Um, and you are considered a professional student. We, UH does not need any parental information, so strictly your tax information is all that we need to do or have. Uh, and the purpose of financial aid or federal financial aid is to assist you. Um, it's not gonna allow you to possibly been, to continue living the way you may have been living prior to starting school. You're gonna have to live like a student with the amount of money that they allow. Um, the financial aid is for tuition fees, the books and your living money and our our awards are for fall spring initially. So once we you're accepted, we receive your FAFSA, you should go through awarding. Unfortunately, we don't have any need-based aid for law students. That all goes to the undergrad students at U of H. So uh, you're only gonna be awarded the unsubsidized Stafford loan in the amount of 20,500. That's the most that we offer. You can fill the gap in your award up to the cost of attendance with a private loan or a grad plus loan. And um, it, that's a personal preference, whether you go with a federal grad plus or a private loan. That is, we don't award that initially because both of those require a credit check and we have chosen not to initiate a credit check on a student's behalf. So that's something once you're accepted, uh, you should get an additional email award notice from through the admissions office on my behalf telling you how to apply for one of these additional loans. Um, you can view our uh, cost of attendance and this is based on an incoming 1L student because they take 31 hours, but you can view this on our website at law.uh.edu under financial aid and then uh, cost of attendance. Um, for them, uh, their budget's 52,120. Um, if you take, you, you could be less just because you may not take the 31 hours. Uh, living expenses is, uh, pretty much stays the same across the board if you're full-time, which is 12 or more hours, and you live off campus. Um, if you're in less than 12 hours, or yes, less than 12 hours, uh, part-time is considered six to eight hours, three-quarter time is nine to 11 hours. And the budget adjusts based on the number of hours you're enrolled in for tuition and books. 
the living money stays the same, all assuming you're off campus. Um, the cost of attendance is nine months, fall, spring only. If you go to summer school, you have to be in six hours. That's a separate loan process, completely separate process. But that summer of 21 will fall under the 2021 FAFSA. So again, we're only going to award 20500 That's not even going to cover tuition. So students will make up the difference with a grad plus and private loan or, or a private loan. Then when you go to summer school, as long as you're in six hours, most everyone will have used their full unsubsidized loan amount. So they will be in a private or grad plus for summer. So that will be more information coming once you register for summer, which will be in the April timeframe of 2021. Uh, the budget after tuition and fees is paid, you end up with about $1,700 a month for living. Um, that is going to be uh, living very conservatively. Uh, financial aid is not meant to cover any kind of personal debt, car insurance, car note, those type of things. It's very minimal coverage for your assistance uh, while you're attending school. Um, once uh, we do get you awarded, um, then you can go into the system, accept your award. Uh, even if you've had loans prior at your other school, you will need to sign a new promissory note. You'll need to do a new entrance counseling at studentaid.gov. Uh, all this information will be forthcoming once you're accepted um, and you get your student ID. Um, and that would come from uh, Pilar Mensa's office. Um, all, like I said, all we offer are the unsubsidized loans. I did just get noticed the other day that that interest rate fell to 4.30 for the life of that loan that you would sign the uh, master promissory note for for the fall and then into the spring of 2021. Um, the fee, I have not heard on that adjustment yet, but it's uh, currently it's at 1.059%. That means that the Department of Ed will not submit the full 20500 to the school. You will get half of your award in the fall and the other half will come in spring. Your fall money needs to last you five months because you don't get your spring money until mid-January. Uh, if you have to go with a grad plus loan, those interest rates drop to 5.30 for the life of that loan. And they have a fee of 4.236%, which can be pretty significant. Uh, if you ended up having to borrow 30000 or 33000 in a grad plus loan, you're looking at the Department of Ed keeping $1,380 as a processing fee. So that could easily be rent and food for someone for a month. Um, if you are doing any kind of, um, if you're a Texas resident, you can do a college access loan, which is a private loan. That's all a personal preference, what type of loan you go with. Um, if you need more detail on what we recommend, you know, feel free to contact me. Um, let me give you my email too. It's lneal, N-E-A-L, at uh.edu. So if you do have any questions uh, that, we've that I've talked about today, please feel free to contact me. Uh, so once you're, uh, say, credit approved, if you go with a private or Grad Plus loan, you would notify me. Grad Plus, I'll process. If it's a private loan, the uh, central campus will have to do that. Once all your money is processed and shows up on your PeopleSoft account as pending financial aid for the fall, you would have met fee payment. Um, more information on fee payment will also be coming out closer to that time, uh, which was usually about two weeks prior to classes starting. Um, like I said, half of all of your award will come out in the fall. It will not disperse to the school until the first day of class at the earliest pay your fee bill and whatever's left over will be refunded to you through a servicer that we call, that we use called Bank Mobile. And more information once you're enrolled will come out about Bank Mobile where you will go to their website, sign up for direct deposit to your personal bank. So the money comes to the school, pays your fee bill, we send it to Bank Mobile the following day. Then within a day or two after that, it should be direct deposited to your personal bank account. Um, 
I would say that don't count on your financial aid to be here in time to cover your September bills because it'll be probably that Friday, the first week of class before you have access to your fall money. So you definitely need to have money prepared to cover anything that's due in August and maybe even the first of September just to make sure you're covered. Um, any scholarships, uh, look at our website at law.uh.edu under scholarships and financial aid. I have a tab over on the left side that'll tell you about uh, outside scholarship opportunities. Uh, each year in the spring, we also have an award ceremony where you can apply or be nominated for an additional scholarship that is processed through the Law Center. Um, I would encourage you to be very careful about any debt um, because the the grad, the grad plus and private loan require the credit check. So you definitely want to keep an eye on your credit. Uh, those are gonna pop up on there as well. The loans will, but if you have any um, adverse credit, you could be denied for one of those loans and it may require a co-signer. Uh, I'd encourage everyone to check annualcreditreport.com to make sure you know what your credit is before you actually make the application to be sure you know everything's in shape. If it's not, it could take a while to get that cleared up. Uh, if we have anybody that is uh, doing Hazelwood, VA benefits, we do that. Um, the Texas Tomorrow Fund, AmeriCorps, all that, you would just notify me that you have those, um, that eligibility, and then we'll get it applied to your fee bill. Um, anyone that is Getting loans where you are now, at the school you're at now, they are reporting your enrollment to keep your loans in deferment. Once you come to U of H, then your loans will, they're not gonna know that until we report it. And that will be after probably that first week of class. So at that point, you may have to contact your servicer to make sure that they have the information that you have moved to another school and are enrolled uh, for those loans to go into deferment. Uh, that's pretty much how all I have to say. Um, are there any questions specifically? Or if not, I'm open to you sending me an email at lneal at uh-edu and I will get back with you to answer any questions. Uh, Laura, just looked like there was one question from Donna that discussed at UHLC, can veterans use Hazelwood? And it sounds like you, you addressed that question. And what was the question again, I'm sorry? Um, at UHLC, can veterans use the Hazelwood benefits? Yes, they can. Uh, Hazelwood will cover up to 150 hours total uh, for the life of it. Uh, if you are uh, expecting to use those, whether it's you being the veteran or a um, parent, uh, if you'll email me, I will send you the list of the forms that we have to have in order for it to apply. It'll cover all, but to, uh, all the tuition and all fees, but about 265 student uh, service fee is the only one it does not cover. Perfect, great. great. Any other questions before we um, turn over to our student panel? This is your time to ask um, our resident financial aid advisor. Um, and I always say about Laura that there are very few schools that have a dedicated financial aid expert um, on campus. And Laura is one of them. We're one of the few schools, one of the few law schools that has such a dedicated resource and she's she's wonderful. So last call for Chris. I'm um, Chris. Yes, let's table any other questions. If it doesn't relate for financial aid, um, let's table that and we can get to um, actually if you want to chat it, I'll try to answer that. And we're just going to wait for our panelists, our current student panels to join us. Laura, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. I wish everyone the best of luck. Hope to see y'all in the fall. Thank you, thank Anne you Laura. Bye. -bye. Chris, why don't you go ahead and chat the question and I'll be able to answer. I know we have um, Bailey, we have Jimmy, and do we have, we're just waiting on Jacqueline. We have four panelists today. There's Lucas. Hi, Lucas. Um, Chris, do you want to shoot us a question? Hi, Bailey. Great. There's Jackie. Am I able to ask a question from an earlier topic? It was mentioned that law review and journal have a positive factor was a positive factor on the tra uh, transfer admissions process. Um, yeah, let me get, I'm gonna take that question kind of offline and that's more of an admissions question. Um, as a transfer student, I'm not sure 
um, but we couldn't apply to UH Law Review until after admit. Yes, so our panelists are going to be able to talk about that, and I can talk about that as well. You're not able to apply for Law Review until you have acceptance. Um, so that is that is true. Um, I'm not sure you were asking if it was earlier mentioned that Law Review and Journal was a positive factor in the transfer admissions process. I'm not aware of transfer applicants that would have uh, Law Review already because most of you are coming from your first year. Um, certainly, if you were able to gain acceptance onto Law Review um, within the first year, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone that, that was able to. In my personal um, experience, when I transferred, I was on Law Review and then had to write on to the school that I transferred to. Um, so again, um, so let's start out with our panel. I think we've got everyone. We've got Bailey, Jackie, uh, Lucas, and let's see who's the other person. Jimmy, is Jimmy on with us? Yes, I'm here. Oh, you are. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to have you come off video if, it, if you don't mind. Um, and then if everyone else can go off of, can disable their video, that way we only have the speakers up right now. Um, what I'd love to do is have our panelists um, introduce yourselves. Lucas, I'll start with you and tell you a little bit about their background. This is our question and answer segment of our class. So we're going to have current students that were transfer students and they are here to answer your questions. You can chat the questions up or you can come off of audio. You can raise, use the raised hand function on Zoom. So Lucas, let's start with you and just give us a brief overview of you and your path to UHLC. Uh, sure. Um, I transferred from South Texas, um, like, like a lot of people. Um, I was Born and raised in Houston. Uh, I went to undergrad in Nashville, Tennessee, um, studied music. So, um, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, transferred last fall. And um, so far, so good. Zero complaints. I think it was a, it's, it's been a positive experience. And I, I also kind of a pattern here, I guess. I, I transferred um, schools in undergrad. So um, that was just comparing the experiences for as far as they can be compared. Um, I think uh, U UHLC does a whole lot more for transfer students. I don't know. In, in, in undergrad, it just kind of, uh, there's this feeling that you were kind of like a second class student for transferring and I've never got that at any point in time um, at U of H. So it's been nothing but a positive experience. Thank you, Lucas. I appreciate that. Jackie, I'll pass it on to you um, and feel free to jump in and tell us about you. Hey, hey everybody. My name is Jackie Boylehart and I too transferred from South Texas. I actually attended the transfer session um, at this time last year. And when I went to the transfer session, I was really undecided about whether or not I wanted to transfer because um, you know, I made a lot of relationships in South Texas and there are a lot of things good that were going on for me in South Texas, but um, I, there are other practice areas. For example, I was in, interested in environmental law and more regulatory practice, which South Texas didn't really have um, the staff to teach those courses. I think it was Professor Moya at the time and maybe a couple others um, that would teach those courses. So it was really a hard decision, but when I attended the transfer in info session last year, uh, there were speakers from South Texas and I was just sold right away. Um, they were on law review and they were in moot court and they were able to kind of mentor me and some other transfers through the process. And I think that's really what made for me the experience um, of transferring to U of H a really positive one. And I hope that we could probably hopefully provide the same for anybody who's interested in transferring to U of H as well. Great, thank you, Jackie. And I, Bailey, I probably, oh, sorry, yeah. I, I probably also should have uh, mentioned um, my my main reason for doing so. Jackie noted on hers, I completely slipped my mind was health law, and uh, similar to Jackie's experience, um, um, there's was nothing nothing in that direction as far as um, classes and coursework, clinics and things uh, from where I came from. So, um, yeah. Great. Um, Jackie, so we just heard from you. Bailey, let's turn to you. We'd love to hear a little bit about you. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm a bit of a wild card, and I transferred from Belmont College of Law in Nashville, Tennessee, I think where Lucas went to undergrad. Um, 
And I had grown up and done all my schooling in Tennessee. So I'm hoping to be here for a resource for people who may not be part of that large crowd that comes from South Texas that, you know, don't have friends that transfer from that group, um, which like Jackie said, can be, uh, you can be easily included if you come to the, like you all have the transfer sessions and anything that's available for transfer students um, to get together because I got to know that group quite quickly. And I, I think I met Jackie like one of the first days and we stay in touch and now we're both on law review and moot court. And um, these relationships, you know, will be the beginnings of your relationships at UH if you do decide to come to UHLC. Um, that being said, I came because our, uh, my husband and I relocated for his job, but it was the best decision that I have ever made. Um, it's an incredible school with so many resources if you choose to use them. And um, I know, like Jackie, having people that were successful as transfer students, um, the editor-in-chief of Houston Law Review when we came on was actually a transfer student, um, really kind of gave us role models and, um, and mentors throughout the whole process. And so I hope to do that for you all. Great. Okay, thank you. And let's go to Jimmy. Hello. Um, sorry, my video is not on. I am not at my house, so my laptop is uh, I left it over there because I'm using my phone. Uh, but uh, I actually am also an outlier. Uh, I came from Mississippi College School of Law. Um, I went there my first year, and then I transferred into U of H Law after two other schools. I was deciding in between, and uh, I chose U of H Law and primarily because I had mentors here, and I had connections to the Houston area and I knew I wanted to go to a school that had a really strong, you know, corporate and business law funnel into, you know, getting a good job doing that type of work. And, um, you know, I'm currently, as soon as I transferred here, I started working for Baker Hughes and uh, in their in-house counsel department. Um, the school has been nothing but great. I've met amazing students. You know, all these people that I've transferred with, we had a specific class that we all took together and everyone's like really nice. Um, you know, if you don't know anybody at the campus, people are more than willing to introduce you, you know, convince you to join organizations. Um, I became, I went onto exec boards just because of knowing people and, you know, just volunteering and things like that. So it's been nothing but advantageous to my, my, my whole experience. And I could have made, had better, I could have made a better decision. Great. Thank you, Jimmy. So um, I'm just going to tell the folks here, you're welcome to come off a of video, use the uh, the wave function or just, I'm sorry, come off a of video and audio, whatever you prefer to ask questions. This is a Q and A panel here. Um, so you can chat a question. Um, one of the things I probably would be really good to talk about is how did you all, I, I know some of you are on law review and on publications. How did you navigate that as your, as a transfer student? So I'll let you guys just jump in right there. Um, so I can start. I attended this session last year and there's um, a girl, Rebecca, and she basically went through the entire law review write-on process. At the time, she described her own write-on process, which I think she wrote on before she was admitted, which is apparently it's not allowed anymore. But she gave us um, two books to reference, which if you're from South Texas, they're the same two books that were probably presented to you at the South Texas transfer session, because she also transfers in South Texas, um, scholarly writing for law students. And she also gave us her example write-on, which when she wrote on, she won the best paper of that year of the write-on group. So if you go in the Houston Law Review and you um, look up her paper, Rebecca Sunny, or I can, you can contact me and I can send it to you. I really use that as a resource for what was expected for the write-on process and how to be successful transfer write-on. And then I was accepted. And really, I, I credit her so much because I don't think I could have done it without her guidance. Um, so yeah. And then I, I wrote on um, with the part-time and transfer student write-on process. And it was a long case. I think it was a gerrymandering case. It was like 60 plus pages. And I just chose a very narrow section. I think I wrote on a jurisdictional issue, but chose something very narrow and pointed and then um, made it to law review. Great, thank you, Jackie. 
Um, so I'm on the uh, Houston Business and Tax Law Journal. Um, I was able to apply on. So the way the business journal works is if you are in the top 35%, they will allow you to apply on and basically it just goes through a panel, the exec panel, which you know reviews your cover letter, your resume, your transcript, and a writing sample, and uh, basically decides whether or not you know they will allow you to be on the journal. And if you're not in the top 35%, um, you can write on which you just have to write on a specific topic and they will allow you to, you know, co compete versus other students that write on. And uh, that's how I got it. I got in as an apply on and uh, I was, I, I basically just reached out to the recruiter after I saw the brochure and he just emailed me the information. And if you need that information, I'm more than happy to email it to you. Um, so just feel free to reach out. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we have a question. What factors um, do we go to everyone? Do we do everyone talk? I was just going to jump in and say I wrote on a law review as well um, and I didn't have to I graded on at my old school so it was kind of a new process for me um, and I one thing I wanted to add to Jackie is because definitely find a mentor and look at examples um, but also read the instructions carefully and make sure you're looking at all of the information that you get make sure your everything is formatted right you have copies going to the right places and everything because you don't want to get disqualified or it be too late and you not know it um, and kind of miss that opportunity for good. Um, so I just wanted to add that to uh, Jimmy and Jackie's. Great. Um, so do you folks want to address the moot court? Some of you participated in moot court and let's um, love for you guys to chat about that if you can. Yeah, so it was, <laughs> it was again, Rebecca, she was on the moot court board and she, um, well, we were accepted in our transfer info session um, after acceptance. They had an email address and she said, okay, contact us if you want to try out. And then the tryout happened shortly um, after school started. And then we made the team. I think tryouts this year because of COVID are actually going to include transfers in the original tryout process. So if anybody is interested in just advocacy in general, that would be moot court mock trial or ADR, um, you can send me your email and I'll make sure that you're included on in this communication uh, so that you can just be included with everybody um, in the first go around. I yes. had a little bit of a different, sorry. No, go right ahead. I was just to say, I um, actually missed the tryout, which Jackie is making sure is not happening um, this time around, but uh, and kind of weasel my way in, but Jackie and I both were able to do competitions and had really good outcomes. Um, and so I would, I did the ABA competition and actually uh, like placed as a regional finalist. We didn't get to go to nationals because of COVID-19, but um, that was, you know, a great achievement. And I would love to talk to anyone who's a transfer student and doesn't think they, you know, haven't done it in the past or anything and maybe interested, I would love to talk to anyone if they want to um, communicate directly with me. Um, and I know uh, Jackie mentioned ADR, the C Alternative Dispute Resolution Team. Um, so for those of you that you know aren't into really litigating and stuff like that, like myself, I plan on doing corporate law specifically, transactional work, but I know that Alternative Dispute Resolution does negotiation, mediation, and arbitration, which is very useful in the transactional world. Um, I basically was able to compete last year and this year and um, i also missed the um, deadline for uh, uh, trying on but they allowed me to do it then the week after just because i was a transfer student but i will make sure that y'all won't have to go through that and i'm sure jackie's going to help with that as well so feel free to reach out if you have any questions for those of you that you know aren't really into litigating but want to do some other form of uh, dispute resolution our, our, so we have a question are any of you part-time students part-time evening students no, we, and we usually do, John. Um, and if you would like, I can certainly get you in touch with our part-time evening student population. They're a great group um, and I can, I can absolutely connect you with them. So we had another question from Antonia. What factors do you think helped you, uh, helped your transfer application? Um, so I think coming from South Texas specifically, I know that my GPA definitely was not the highest of the transfer applicants. And I know that because I had other transfers 
um, from South Texas to U of H, just very flat out like asked me what my GPA was and they applied but they didn't get in and all these things. And there was a couple people that did that. So I know that my GPA was definitely in the range but wasn't the highest of the group. And also um, I think that my personal statement probably stood out with, I had a very specific reason for transferring from South Texas to U of H that didn't disparage what's at South Texas um, because South Texas is a very strong litigation focus. I appreciated everything that I got there and I'm really glad I had my one L year there, but there were just special classes that I would have had to take as a visiting student anyway at U of H. So I might as well just go to U of H and build community there instead of being a visiting student and all of those type of logistics. Right. Yeah, I, I would I would just double down on that um, personal statement. Mine was very narrow as well, um, but also just grades above all else too. Um, but yeah, I, I I think Jackie hits on something that's pretty important too. Is um, what I've what I've been blown away by is uh, like kind of the advantage of being a transfer student is um, the maintaining contacts in your previous law schools network. So like, you know, if you decide to transfer to U of H, like your network's going to double. And so much of kind of this industry, at least as far as I can tell, and as far as mentors have told me is the networking aspect. So um, you really don't uh, want to disparage your, you know, where you're coming from. I mean, it's something to be proud of. Uh, everyone has their reasons for you know, the decisions they make and where they want to go and what they want to do with their education and career and so forth. But um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think um, that's that, that very, very well said that, um, you know, there are, you, perhaps there's, um, there could be any number of reasons for why you're looking towards UHLC. Um, and I mean, it's just setting those out without, you um, without necessarily framing it as just, you know, the grass is always greener type thing. Uh, so for me, I would think that it was the personal statement as well as my grades. The reason being is that my first semester, I didn't do too hot. Um, I was probably in the top 65% my first semester just because I went from a completely different career background, went coming from engineering to law school. So I hadn't, I hadn't really uh, gotten used to, you know, having multiple ways to get into a conclusion. I was so used to, you know, science and math, just always having an answer. But second semester, I jumped from there to the top 20%. And I think that really showed kind of the grit and work ethic. And then my personal statement explained why I wanted to go to Houston. And, uh, you know, I've gotten mentors. I, I got a job in Houston that summer coming. So even if I didn't transfer, I was still gonna work in Houston to show that I really wanted to be in Houston. So I think that, you know, having that uh, job in play my personal statement explaining why I wanted to be there and then the grip showing, you know, my work ethic when it came to grades and school and, you know, being, being able to manipulate the, the fact that I really wanted to do really well in law school helped out my, uh, my chances of getting into your age. I agree with Jimmy being someone that, I'm sorry. This is fun. This is the fun part of Zoom. But I was just going to say with Jimmy. It happens. Sorry, everyone. Um, being from out of state, you need to make some kind of connection to why you're coming to, law, to Houston. And I think for me, it was I wanted to go to Houston actually before uh, I had applied originally um, and was just going to go and move states on my own behalf. And so I mentioned that. Um, and, you know, I, I said a lot of things about the city and the and the opportunities here um, that in my personal statement, it made a connection for them because uh, they want to produce someone that's going to give back to the uh, I'm sorry, I'm having technical issues. Sorry, everyone, give back to the community. So just make a connection in your personal statement. And also remember that they're looking at your writing as well. And so to take every opportunity to edit, 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 and make it clear and great communication and uh, read books on how to write and all of that. 
Great. So let's go to questions. What other questions do we have? Um, feel free to come off of um, your mute and ask questions. Um, we've got about 10 more minutes. So feel free, Samuel, do you have a question? No? Okay. We have one uh, on here. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I have a question. I just wanted to ask, um, do you have a specified number of stocks each year for um, transfer students or um, does that depend on how many applications you get or a combination of both? I didn't catch the first part of your question. So what was it? Okay, I was asking if you have um, if you have a specified or a specific number of slots each year for your transfers, for the number of transfers you can accommodate, or does that depend on how many applications you receive or both? Yeah, it's gonna. We don't have a specific number. It's just gonna depend on how many we receive, and um, we were and and the applications themselves. So uh, we don't have a limit that I know of. Um, so. Nope, there's no set number. Um, has U of H made a decision how they are viewing pass-fail grades due to COVID that are transferring in for transfer applications? So I covered this in the beginning and I'm happy to share it again. Most, if not all law schools um, in the spring semester have gone to some form of alternative grading structure. Biggest question I get every day is how are we gonna handle that? What we're gonna do is we're still gonna do a full file review of your application materials um, we're going to base our decision on all things that are submitted in your application, personal statement, letters of recommendation, class rank, and then we're going to look at the grades that we do have. If we, you have pass fail, we're going to look at pass fail. If you have a semester, your first semester, half of this uh, one semester's grades, we're going to look at it that way. It's how we're adapting right now. Certainly not going to have a negative impact on your application or your chances if you have a pass fail because most of the law schools across the country went to pass fail. What other questions can we ask? I have a question for you. Sure. Um, so I'm coming from Louisiana, obviously a civil law state, and I heard you mention a core curriculum or kind of core curriculum that y'all look at for first year students. And I was wondering what that looks like coming from, is, it, is that uh, credit still accepted being from a civil law state, obviously going to a common law state. Uh, you know, that's something I might have to circle back with you on. On our website, we talk about the classes that we're looking for. We want you to have completed all or substantially all of your first year classes. So we're talking about contracts, mm -hmm. property, civil procedure, constitutional mm -hmm. law. Um, you can look on our website. If you don't have all of those, mm -hmm. we will make a determination based on the classes that you do have. And then my, my guess is that once you do transfer in, we would be required to take some other courses to supplement that. Okay, because um, I have like a, a civil law property and I don't know if, if y'all would look at that as taking and completing a property course. I do not know the answer to that. I think it's on a case-by-case -case available basis. Okay. Um, it sounds like you've, most law schools, it sounds like you you will have completed a majority of the first year classes and that's what we're looking for. Certainly okay. legal research and writing, that's a really important class that we're going to look to and see what your grade it was in legal research and writing. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Who, what else, guys? We've got about five or ten more minutes, um, so I jump actually, in. Don't be shy. Matthew. Yeah, I actually have a question that I think kind of stems off of that a little bit. Um, so I've taken all of the classes that you're looking for in terms of the first year, but I'm mm -hmm. actually also in um, some classes now during, during our summer session. I'm curious, um, will you look at those too, be, I'm, I'm, the summer classes in addition, or it, I guess it depends on, you know, when I get in the, inf the material more so, but um, I'm doing well in them, so I was hopeful that um, they would be considered as well. Yeah, I would, I would let the admissions office know that you're taking summer classes, um, and depending on when those grades will come in, whether we can accommodate and whether we can review them. Um, to okay. make a determination, but I would just shoot us an email and just let us know that you'd like us to wait if at all possible. It really comes down to how quickly your your school can get the grades into us. Yeah. So if they can't get them into us until August 7th, close of business day, there's not much we can do because we still need to review your application, make a determination, 
in time for you to start school at, at U of H. Okay. And yeah. then if, if I'm able, I have one more question in sure. terms of letters of recommendation. Um, I'm sure you want like a current professor, you know, at the law school um, that here, but I actually worked a while in school about like 20 to 25 hours. Um, would you probably like the employer in one professor? Is that probably your recommendation for my situation? Or um, panelists, I don't remember who I got for my letters of recommendation. If yeah. it helps, I didn't have a current professor. That's um, kind of scary if you think about it, because if you don't get accepted, you know, like, then they know you tried to leave. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant as well. So. No, I, I, I think um, I, had, I had a couple that I had asked, um, approached about a letter of recommendation and what it came down to was time because I applied to transfer pretty late. Um, but they were all very cool about it. Like it, okay. I mean, there, there was some joking about like, oh, you're leaving us, that, that's a bummer. But um, yeah, no, it, um, oh, that's I think if, if there are professors you have a relationship with, just, I mean, speaking from my own experience, uh, you, you know, you're not, I, I, what I feel is like educators want what's best for their students. And if what's best for you is to come to UHLC, then I think they'll, and you communicate that, then, then they'll see that. So I wouldn't stress out about it. Um, but on your, so like on your last question, I can't really talk about it from an admission standpoint, but I was taking evidence over the summer. And um, I know that we were capped at like 30 transfer credits, um, which covered all the 1L classes, but I did get like uh, equivalents for purposes of evidence. It didn't like give me any extra credits beyond that 30, but evidence is a prerequisite for some other classes. So I didn't have to double back and take it. So um, it's whatever's in progress over the summer um, after you're admitted, you still can get um, credit for it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I also have a few quick questions if that's okay. Sure. Okay, um, so first one with the transcript. So I actually requested mine through the clearinghouse, like the National Clearinghouse portal through Stetson and supposed to go directly to your school. I don't know if, if that's okay, because I know you guys did want it mailed. Is going through the clearinghouse also an acceptable way to receive a transcript? It should be. It's, it, I know they're mailing it directly to you. Yep, if it's an official transcript, and I think that's how you get official transcripts. So, yes. Okay, great. And then as far as the letter of good standing, I know some schools have like templates that they specifically want the schools to use. Um, it, is it just any school that my registrar's office wants to use to send to you guys? Or do you have a specific form that they need to fill out to send over to you? We do not. It's just a letter of good standing from your home school, um, from your present law school, an official letter of good standing. So it needs to come from your registrar. Perfect. And then my last question is actually, so if we come in with a good rank and a good GPA, when we're going into the on-campus recruitment at the beginning, is there a way, so I know on our resume we can have our rank and our GPA, but it, does it affect us as transfers in the process? I know a lot of schools are also considering in the fall possibly doing finals online. I think UT made that decision this year with finals, you know, taking place online and not having students come back after Thanksgiving break, which would mean that transfers wouldn't have um, a GPA next fall as well. Do you know how, how that might plan out or have you guys kind of thought about that process at all? Whether we're like our, our schedule, whether we're going to come back after Thanksgiving? Yeah, well, rather there's going to be grades because I'm more worried about just applying for jobs and not having a new, you know, GPA or a new rank to. Right. My guess is that we are going to have grades um, okay. because, okay. right, because OCI is going to be, OCI is going on in the summer. Then they're going to do, there's a pretty significant winter OCI. So I couldn't imagine them not issuing grades in time for that. Um, Houston's the fourth largest um, city in the U.S. and I think the third largest legal market. It's a massive legal market. So we're going to, we have a lot of people looking um, and we're going to have to accommodate that. So that might be a question that you'd want to take up with Paul Killinger um, and make sure, but I don't, I don't anticipate um, that we won't have grades. But again, all of this is fluid because we're in <laughs> such a weird situation. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. You're um, welcome. I 
just to add to that, just if you want some help. So when I spoke to Paul Klinger when I was transferring, that was kind of my concern as well. You know, when you're applying to jobs as a 2L and you're a transfer and my GPA is going to be a zero because you're starting all over. Uh, you basically, under your education on your resume, you'd put the school that you're currently at with your ranking and GPA. And then mm -hmm. you would add U of, H, uh, U of H's law school up to the top and just put that your uh, anticipated graduation date would be 2022 for you guys or 2021, whatever it is. And then you just wouldn't have a GPA or anything. You just have, you know, the, the school that you're attending currently and then the school that you used to go to with your ranking and stuff. So the employers can see that you transferred and the grade that you had your first year. That's really helpful. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Matthew, John? Uh, yeah, I actually had a question. It kind of piggybacks off of Matthew earlier, and it'll be quick. Um, I, too, am taking, a, for example, a course right now during the summer, it's domestic violence. But assuming an individual meets all the requirements, uh, you know, and meets early decision deadline, um, all grades I've posted, transcripts been sent out, I meet the minimum 22. Um, they won't hold off on making the decision if they can make one um, just based on that summer course I'm taking because that grade won't technically post till August uh, in my case. So if I meet all other requirements, I know I'll still have to send one more official transcript so that that domestic violence in this case grade, you guys actually receive it, but it's not gonna hinder an early decision to be made assuming I meet all other requirements, is that correct? If you have uh, if you have the minimum twenty two credit hours before taking this without summer it, class, yeah, without that domestic violence, yeah. you will you you will not be delayed. We okay, will awesome. Be, yeah, you'll just expect the final transcript once that grade posts. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, awesome. Thank you so much for clarifying that. You're welcome. Any Matthew? Do you have a question? No, ma'am. Okay, uh, last call for questions. One last question, please. Sure. Um, I, my understanding is that for your current um, uh, second year part-time students, they are able to take classes both in the evening and during the day. Um, is that correct? You can request it. If you are you are you interested in transferring into our part-time evening program? Are you a current part-time evening program somewhere? No, I'm, I'm a current, I mean, a full-time program where I'm looking to transfer part-time, but uh, my understanding was that in new age, you have the option of taking some of your classes during the day. Um, you do. That's something that you can work on with, um, with the Office of Student Services, and they can determine whether you can take classes during the day. Generally speaking, our second and third and fourth year part-time evening students do have the ability to take classes during the day. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, I want to thank our panelists for joining us today and thank you everyone for um, your participation. I hope that this answered everyone's questions. Lucas, Jackie, Bailey, and Jimmy, I really appreciate it. Um, on behalf of UH Admissions, I wish you all the best of luck. Hope to see you all and everyone stay safe. Take care everyone.